I went to the buffet yesterday, so I'm sorry about my bloated face and pimples. You'll just have to deal with it during this Q&A. So let's get started. Alex, can you explain why you can round your back during your Jefferson or Hack deadlift without lower back problems? Yes. It's basic leverages. Here's what you have to understand. Gravity operates in a straight or vertical line. And anything that deviates away from this line is called a moment arm. It's horizontal distance that you have to overcome. That's why if you deadlift with the weight six inches in front of your body, it's much more difficult. And that's also why a trap bar deadlift is easier typically than a conventional deadlift. The bar is even with your hips. So the closer you have the bar to your hips, the easier it's gonna be. And also the less forward it is, the easier it's gonna be. So the more neutral, the more behind your body, you have better leverages. Now, when you have the bar directly in front of you, like really far ahead, like you would in a conventional deadlift, there's more shearing forces on the spine. That's a fact. Now there's a few ways you can get around this. You can either pull off blocks, so there's gonna be less hip flexion and the bar's closer to you, or you can use the trap bar behind the back deadlift or Jefferson. You see with the Jefferson, the bar is directly underneath your body, like it's underneath your nuts. So the moment arm, the horizontal distance between the hips and the bar is inexistent. Less shearing forces on the spine. This is a fact, which means you can round your back a little bit more. You can tolerate a little bit of spinal flexion and it's not going to cause injury compared to a conventional deadlift. If you have the bar in front of you, because of the shearing forces, because of the moment arm, there's more lower back pressure. That's again, an undeniable fact. When you go behind the back, it's literally behind your body. Less of a moment arm, less shearing. You can actually round your entire back when you do a behind the back deadlift. Now, I'm not gonna recommend this. I don't recommend that at all. I think you should try to keep it at least like straight. But you could round much more on a behind the back than a conventional, there's less force on it. And also because of the leverages as a whole, behind the back, more quad dominant, okay? Less emphasis on the posterior chain for the most part. So as a result, you're gonna feel less muscular tension in those areas. So that's why you can do stuff like Jefferson's and behind the back and not experience any pain. It's because of the leverages, the moment arms, all that stuff and the muscle groups utilized. And that's also why I'm such a big believer in them. In my opinion, Jefferson deadlift, behind the back deadlift, trap bar deadlift, that's my big three. In terms of poles, man, those are the big money makers if you're gonna go off the floor. Like hands down, safest variations that exist. The only one that would be debatable is a Jefferson because there's a little bit of twisting there. But trap bar behind the back, fantastic on the lower back. Squatting is destroying my lower back. Will gaining weight help with this? How do I fix this? I don't think gaining weight is gonna really help you that much. To me, it sounds like you got a weak core or your form is really not that good. Or maybe you're rounding into a belt. You're probably doing a good morning type of squat. So what I'm gonna recommend that you do is start performing a lot of front squats. Front squats will require thoracic extension, AKA an upright torso, and it's gonna work your core a lot more compared to the back squat. You're gonna feel your abs, like you're gonna have ab doms the next day. So try out the front squat. You can even do the zercher squat if you feel like it, but point is put the bar in front of your body, start squatting with a more upright torso. You can even try out the safety squat bar if you have access to one, okay? That's gonna be the first thing. Now, once you've done that for a little bit of time, go back to back squats, but refine your technique. Make sure that you're not folding into a good morning. Drop the weight 30%, build back up slowly. Whenever you have form breakdown, back down, man. You don't wanna get injured here. And also address your weak links. Address your weak quads, address your core, address the thoracic extension. Don't fold into a good morning when you're squatting. And also pay attention to where the bar is. Maybe low bar squats aren't for you. Maybe you should do high bar squats or consider using the safety squat bar, like I said before. But point is, you likely have a weak core, uh, and bad form. So focus on those things and the lower back pain will go away. Do I have above average genetics if I'm aesthetic as fuck but didn't even hit intermediate strength standards? For uh, bodybuilding, probably. So I, I would say there's two things going on here. Either you're genetically blessed, so you're just this mass monster yet you're not even intermediate, you've been lifting for like a year and you're just huge. That could happen. Or you're delusional. You think that you're big but you're actually not. So you have like uh, this syndrome, this weird syndrome. You look in the mirror and you see like a freaking Mr. Muscle Man. There are some people like that on Instagram. You'll see these guys, like they're, they're fat, like they're delusional, man. They're really, really fat. They're skinny looking, skinny fat often, and they're, they think that they're buff. Some of these guys even compete on bodybuilding shows. Like you see them step up on a stage, no conditioning, muscular. I'm talking about like the definition, uh, small muscles. Like you have guys who actually think they're big, but they're just small as hell. So delusional people do exist. So I don't know if you're in that situation, but I'm gonna agree with you. I'm gonna just take your word for it 
that you do look jacked, that you're just this mass monster and you're genetically blessed. I will assume that what you're saying is correct. Thoughts on Omar Esau's video on weighted push-ups as a primary bench variation for carryover. A1, really, really good video. And I'm very happy that we have guys like Omar who just tell it how it is, man. Omar has always been a non-biased guy from the very start. He shares different perspectives. He invites different guests to his channel. He's open. And I've always respected him greatly. So when he put out that video, I was like, fuck yeah, man. You're saying the truth. This is what it is. I love that exercise. The way to push up, the way that he's describing it, where you're handling a dip belt on your chest, you're on a bench and you're just doing the push ups like off a rack or something like that. Oh man, it's so good. Like I'm even gonna start doing them. Not because I saw it from Omar though, because I've, I've known about this from fitness FAQs and Twisting Nether, but um, it's a great lift. It really is. It's going to allow you to build strength in a safe and effective way, as well as hypertrophy those pecs. Like you can do a lot of it. It's not going to strain your shoulders. And you're also going to work your serratus. You're moving through space. Very functional exercise. going to help you if you're a combat athlete. This is like one of the best presses you could do. And I think that uh, you guys are going to enjoy it very much if you want safe and effective strength training and muscle building. So give it a shot. You will not regret it. What can I do to get my tendons stronger, faster for ring work? Take it easy, my friend. You don't want to rush the rings too fast or you can get a serious injury. Rings is not like weightlifting, man. It's really not. Trust me, I know. I've been doing the rings. It's, it's very different. You have to slowly build up that tendon strength with progressions. You don't just jump into the hardest moves right away. That's how you snap yourself. So you want to start off with the basics. I started off with freaking RTO, not even RTO, just regular ring push-up holds. Like locked elbows, just holding myself with the rings. An even more simple variation is holding yourself up off the knees, doing a push-up off the knees holding. I started with the holding, man. I started with ring pull-ups. I started with the most basic stuff imaginable, but with the locked arms. And then I slowly progress into more advanced moves. And I'm still not where I need to be. Like for me, I'm a lot stronger at basic movements like pull-ups, dips, you know, stuff like that, weighted exercises. But you make me go on rings, it's like you need very specific tendon strength and you need time. This takes a lot of time. Don't rush into these moves. You have to slowly build up that tendon strength over time. Now that said, what can you do to strengthen them? Well, find a sport specific movements. A good one is to take two bands, attach it like far away, lock your elbows out. Okay. And just do this, these little motions, like these little fly motions with locked elbows. That's going to condition your elbows. You can also lie down on a bench, holding two dumbbells in your hand and do circular motions behind your body, locked elbows. That's going to condition them, you know, for planches and stuff like that. You could even do a lot of uh, pushdowns and curls, man, with bands. Or just high rep body weight stuff. You, you want to you wanna be specific to what you're trying to improve upon here. Usually it's going to be the locked elbow position. And you want to do body weight stuff. So try the combination of bands, free weights, and a little bit of uh, moves progression-wise. And you should be good. When you cut, do you incorporate any refeed days? Or is it just straight deficits with no refeeds? I do refeeds. To me, it just makes more sense and I get better workouts from it. So maybe once or twice a week, I'll just go crazy on the carbs and I might actually eat in a slight surplus, very, very slight, you know, and I'll find that my next workout, I feel a lot better, more recovered and it's just, you know, you're more full, you're more full in everything. So I'm a big fan of refeeds. I've talked about it on the alpha diet and I've talked about it on my channel as well. So feel free to incorporate it, man. You're not going to gain weight from it. It's just a little bit of... You know, it's just a day where you get to feast, enjoy yourself, kind of eases your mind a little bit. It's not a cheat day necessarily, although it could be. But um, yeah, try our refeed days. Based off of my experience, they're fantastic. Your thoughts on high frequent push-pull plan. I like it. See, that's what it should be. It makes more sense than a push-pull legs. Do push-pull, 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 push-pull. That's called being effective with your time. Yeah, that's very effective. That's really, it's perfect for recovery because you get 48 hours between the pushing and the pulling uh, muscles. It's technically full body because when you do pushes, that's going to include your squats. On your poles, you might do some deadlifts, like a, a type of deadlift of some, of some type, you know, or a rack pull or something. So it makes sense recovery-wise. There'll be less interference compared to a push-pull legs. You're going to get more training frequency. It's every day for the most part. So very good muscle gains, get very good strength gains. This is what I would prefer as opposed to a classic push-pull legs off, push-pull legs off. To me, that doesn't make sense because you're getting twice a week muscle protein synthesis to train six days a week. doesn't make sense. You have less recovery. I just, I'm not a fan of that. So a push-pull, like push-pull, push-pull, push-pull into infinity 
is the shit. Or just a regular push pull, I much prefer that over push pull legs, absolutely. How can I improve my wide grip overhead press? What are some best accessories for it? Well, for one, you wanna do more wide grip overhead press. That's a starter right there. So my advice is to do uh, wide grip touch and go, wide grip pause, uh, Swiss bar overhead press with the widest handles, even doing dumbbell press with the weights like outside of your body, not so in. When you go really in, it's easier to do because of leverages and you feel more triceps. So bring it out, bring it out, but still tuck them. You know, and you wanna be pressing away from your body, not like towards your head. Do a lot of those. And yeah, that's my best advice for you. It's pretty simple. Good day, Alex. Does weighted chin-ups have a direct carryover to the one-arm chin? If I can pull my own body weight in the weighted chin, I should theoretically be able to perform the one-arm variation. Depends, 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 okay. I've done 145 pounds on the weighted chin-up, and at that time, I was unable to do a one-arm chin. It's not exactly the same. Like, the way that I got the one-arm chin was by being very specific, not even doing weighted pull-ups. I haven't done weighted pull-ups in a long time. The max I've gone up to was like 45 pounds, just for volume work. So, I mainly just do bodyweight stuff, and I practice very specific variations. I'll do isometrics, there's one hand at the top. I'll do negatives. I'll do uh, like archer type pull-ups or, or, or like one hand assisted. I'll do stuff like that. But I find that the one arm chin, based off my experience, I'm because sp I actually did it, okay? You have to be specific for it. And I find that the way to chin up, it, does, it's, it is gonna help you. Without a doubt, it's gonna help you. It's gonna improve your base, but it's not the most important thing. In fact, I've known guys that cannot do as much as me on the way to chin, but they could do one arm for reps. So you have to be very specific with it. Start doing the isometrics and negatives. You're going to see it's going to improve a lot more than if you just focus on the weighted chin. But I'm not going to say you shouldn't do it, all right? You're definitely going to have a bigger base. A good program would be uh, weighted, right? Then you do some volume. Then you do your, uh, your specific stuff. That works pretty well. Or you do your specific stuff first and the weighted stuff after, you know, and the volume after. Either way, you can't go wrong. It's not a bad idea. I would strongly recommend that you do weighted chin-ups. It's going to take your physique to the next level and it's going to help you. Ultimately, it will help you. But if you really want to get that one arm chin, you got to start being more specific, in my opinion, of course, because I'm speaking off experience here. No matter what I do, the barbell bench press hurts my shoulders, but I love doing it. Is there a way I can perform it without pain? Uh, yes. First of all, is your form on point? There's a high chance that you're benching like a bro. Elbows completely fl uh, flared out, scapula, not retracted, no tightness whatsoever. Please watch Dave Tate's Bench Press Cure. Now, if that doesn't help you, I'm going to recommend that you switch to a close grip. Start pausing on your presses. Even consider using something like a slingshot, which will deload the shoulders at the bottom a little bit. And then the last resort is to do the Swiss bar bench press. Swiss bar is neutral grip. It's gonna be a lot less stress on your shoulders, the negative pain that is, and it should allow you to press in a more safe manner. But um, yeah, I think with all those tips that I just mentioned, you should be good. You should be good to go. Pike push-ups for shoulders. Yeah, that's good. Very good indeed, my friend. I did like deep deficit pike push-ups and my shoulders were on fire. I couldn't even overhead press the bar after doing that because they're, it smokes them. I'm gonna say this, right? Elevate your legs on a surface, put your legs on top of it like you're gonna do an incline push-up and instead just do the pike push-up. It's gonna feel like you're doing handstand push-ups because of the leverages, okay? It's a little bit easier compared to the handstand push-up but it'll be around the same. Actually, it's gonna be harder than what you have your, your legs against the wall because when you have your legs against the wall, you're kind of leveraging out. But with this, you're really gonna feel those shoulders. And at the bottom, you wanna hold on to some parallettes or some blocks to get a really deep range of motion, like super deep. You do those for like five sets of 10 to 20 reps with 30 second rest intervals, oh my God, your shoulders gonna be on fire. You're gonna be like, holy crap, I don't even need to do overhead press anymore. In fact, when I first bought my home gym, I was thinking like, do I even need this stuff? Like I could literally, theoretically, I could just get on that and I'll be just fine. That's how good it is. So try out the pike push-up, man. Elevate yourself, do some volume, low rest. You're gonna feel an insane shoulder pump. You'll be amazed, honestly. You don't have to be uh, Mr. Stability to get big shoulders. That's not really what you need for bodybuilding, okay? What is a vertical pull on lower days? Also, can I keep the exercise selection the same for both volume and intensity on upper lower? Well, the vertical pull is, uh, that's what it is. It is the vertical pull movement pattern. If I do a bench press, it is a horizontal push. If I do a bubble row, it is a horizontal pull. If I do a vertical push, that's an overhead press. If I do a vertical pull, that's a lat pull down or a way to pull up. So that's all it means. When you say vertical pull, it means the vertical pulling movement pattern. And the reason why I added that for naturally enhanced on the lower days is for specificity on your squats. 
So when you do squats, you want to have a tight upper back, right? And I feel that doing vertical pulls is going to help you with that. It's also going to traction the spine too from all the heavy work that you did. If you do a lot of pull downs, it's going to traction your upper back, even the lower back to a certain extent. If you do weighted pull-ups, traction is the whole spine. So for that reason alone, it's going to actually improve your recovery. That's why I included it. And it's always good to get some extra back volume in your program. Now, as far as keeping the exercise selection the same on both days, that's fine. Perfectly fine. But just make sure that you rotate. If you're going to do that, I would rotate every week. I think you're going to have to rotate more frequently if you keep the movements the same on both days. Just based off my experience, that's what I found. But yeah, you can keep it the same. I like to mix it. But if you want to keep it the same, that's fine. Hey, Alex, I've been thinking about buying Naturally Enhanced. Could you describe what does it exactly include? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Basically, it is a textbook, 458 pages, and it is digitally sold. You'll receive a PDF via your email once you make the purchase. So it's 458 pages. Go to the sales page, outalpha.com slash any, and it'll give you a good idea of what to expect, right? You'll see the testimonials there. Some of them, there's obviously a lot more that I haven't posted due to consent and stuff like that. But you'll see some testimonials and you'll see the table of contents as well to a certain extent. But it's basically, it's an instructional manual, right? First part of the book is all about uh, training programming. It's all written. I describe uh, what the system is, concurrent periodization, the different types of training that exist. Then I get into the programming template itself. I describe uh, volume, intensity, exercise, rotation, selection, all that good stuff. And then as we progress further into the book, I start showing you the special exercises, right? So the six essential muscle groups, neck, traps, upper back, shoulders, forearms, and glutes. I show you movements with pictures for everything with full explanations. So basically all you got to do is follow the template that I indicated at the beginning of the book and include the exercises and then put your own sets and reps. So it's a customizable system. It's not some cookie cutter bullshit. When you get naturally enhanced, it's a system that is made for you. That's why it cannot fail. It is bulletproof. Once you get it right, once you get the exercise selection down and you manage your volume intensity the proper way, gains are 100% insured, even if you're an advanced lifter, because it's calibrated for you. So anyone who says, oh, it didn't work for me or whatever, you didn't do it properly because it's foolproof. It's 100% customizable. It's not some cookie cutter shit, right? I designed it for everybody. That's really what it is. You just follow the template, volume intensity management, rotate the correct movements. It cannot fail. So that's what it is. It's a textbook that shows you how to train. It gives you the program. It gives you the movements. And I also include some sample systems at the end, okay? Now, mind you, they're just samples. I recommend you create your own program, but you could use it as an idea. So that's what you can expect from the book. Is there any benefit to training calves? I've never trained them, and mine are a decent size. There are some benefits, yes. If you're an athlete, train your calves. It's going to prevent uh, knee pain because it kind of, like the calf and hamstring area ties in together. So the more you train your calves, you're actually going to have less knee pain less shin splints as well. So it's very beneficial to train your calves and also a lot of runners train their calves. It, it can increase your sprinting abilities. You know, if you read the book, Special Strength Training, a manual for all coaches, Dr. Vrikashansky has you do calf raises. And mind you, this book was written a long time ago. So he would have you take a bar, put it on your back and just stand up like that. Classic calf raise, man. That's the original way of doing it. And he recommended this for sprinters. He recommended the depth jumps and the calf raises. Like that combination is very, very good for athletes. So yeah, train your calves, man. It's going to prevent knee pain from arising. It's really going to help with that. Great if you're a runner, great if you're a field athlete, you can't go wrong. So it's mainly for the performance, you know, but um, if you don't really care about it and you're, you're decent size and bodybuilding wise, you don't want to train them, then fine, be my guest. I'm not saying it's essential, but it could help you. Definitely. Thoughts on teens taking SARMs. I think it's a horrible idea. And you should never, ever, ever consider it. Neither should you consider taking steroids as a teenager, unless you have top of the line genetics and you can make a serious living off this in the future, right? That's the only consideration that I would make in regards to that. But SARMs, are you kidding me? Or just any roids at all as a teenager? You haven't even been in the gym for a long time. You haven't paid your dues, buddy. You, you haven't. Someone is going to become enhanced. They should at least wait till age 21 to make sure that everything is done developing and they paid their dues. And this is assuming that they start at a young age as well. In my eyes, you need minimum five years of training experience naturally before you can ever consider that stuff. And personally, I recommend that you stay the fuck away from it, period. Because I strongly believe it, that it's going to kill you. That's going to fuck up your health. Permanent physical changes, lots of side effects, lots of things that we don't know yet. And I know a bunch of gearheads are going to come over here and they're going to try to bait me. I don't give a fuck what you say. 
I think it's not good to be injecting foreign substances into your body, especially if it's not pharma grade. You want to buy some shit off the internet or off your local drug dealer, inject it into your fucking ass, whatever you do, and you think that's going to be healthy for you? I think you're very delusional. So I do not support teenagers taking drugs. I'm anti-drug. Yeah, I'm going to say I'm anti-fucking drugs. Some guys say, oh, I don't care what people do. I don't mind what guys do. I appreciate an honest dude, but I'm anti. I'm anti-roid over here. Now, keep in mind, if you take shit, that's fine. I'm not going to judge you. You're welcome. I'm going to give you advice, but I don't recommend it. I, I will never on this channel encourage drug use, especially among teenagers or adults. The only consideration would be testosterone replacement therapy. But you, a young man, you're not even 20 years old yet, and you want to get on some stuff. I don't care how minor the dose is. I don't care how little the side effects are. You haven't paid your dues. Train for at least five years, get some experience, wait till you're an adult, and then consider it if you want to. But uh, if you're not going to make a living off this professionally, I think you're seriously wasting your time and you're going to make a great mistake for your health. So that's just my opinion on it. You have the right to disagree. And for all you roid heads, I don't give a fuck what you have to say. I'm just saying what I believe to be true. What's your favorite Dragon Ball character? In the past, like when I was a kid growing up, Goku was my favorite. But as I grew older, man, it, he started getting on my nerves, man. He started getting on my nerves because I wasn't... I, I identified more with Vegeta, you know? After like... I, I like Vegeta a lot, man. Vegeta's probably my favorite character. And Super, they kind of... They fucked him up a little bit. I don't like how they pussified him in a sense. He couldn't even name his own child. Boma kind of rules over him. He's become more wimpy. I don't like that about him in Super. You know, he's lost a bit of that pride, I find, you know? But in Z and Dragon Ball Z, all through the Saiyan saga, all the way to Boo, like, it, it was... I, I love Vegeta, man. Vegeta is my man. Like, that's the dude, like, I can relate to him on all levels. So I would say Vegeta's number one, Goku is second, and then uh, Piccolo will be third. I fucking love Piccolo. Piccolo's a shit. I love how he's like so much of an asshole, you know? He was just like so bold in your face, just telling you how it is. I like Piccolo. So that's my top three. I know it's pretty generic, but uh, that's, that's my top three, yeah? How'd you get your scar on your left eyebrow? You really want to know? Last question of the week. Alex, you agree that sometimes when your goals and intentions are known, some friends will try to undermine you from reaching your goals. What do you do in such situations? Conceal your goals? Absolutely. I strongly recommend that you don't tell anyone. Be 100% secretive and just do your own business and succeed. And eventually, you're just going to blow out out of nowhere and your friends are going to be like, whoa, what just happened? Because let me tell you this, right? If you tell your friends or people that you know what you're, what you're planning to do, they're going to try to put you down and they're going to put you in a bad state of mind and uh, they're going to treat you a lot differently. I can promise you that. I'll share with you a little story that happened to me many, many, many years ago. There was a man named Andrew. And Andrew, if you're watching this video... Fuck you. So see, go fuck yourself. I was right. You were wrong. And look what happened to you. So this guy named Andrew, right? I had a conversation with him about some business plans because he was a smart guy, right? And I had a little discussion with him. And he told me that it was never going to work. He looked at me in the eyes, insulted me, said all kinds of mean things. And uh, this guy was really like letting me have it. Saying, oh, it's not going to work, blah, blah, blah. Going crazy with all his little theories, right? He was a smart guy, very, very, very smart guy, extremely high IQ, okay? But um, he was just spewing nonsense left and right, and I said, you know what, man? You're wrong. I'm going to succeed one day. I'm going to own my own business, and I'm going to be doing some things. He said, yeah, I doubt that, but uh, we'll see. And uh, I said, okay, we'll see. So I shook his hand, gave him a nice little smile, and I never talked to him again. Now, guess what? I did succeed. And you know what happened to Mr. Andrew? Mmm. Something crazy happened to him. Something that uh, I can't even talk about on this channel. But uh, let's just say that karma is a bitch. And that's just how life works. So today, I've done some things. And he hasn't. He's, he's set way back. Because he thought he was so fucking smart. So be careful with all these know it all And don't tell anybody your business. Be secretive. Do your thing in silence. Just lock yourself up. People think that, they're, that you're crazy or that there's something wrong with you or if they're worried, don't, don't pay attention to it. Do it anyway. Invest now for tomorrow. Put in that freaking work and don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody jack shit. And if they really keep pressuring you, okay, fine, tell them. But uh, don't hang around with them. Leave your friends. Be alone. Study. Be on that grind. And just do what you got to do. And forget about the whole world. Become a hermit. Become isolated. Go off-grid if you have to. Do your business. 
and you don't have to justify yourself to anybody because they're going to try to put you down. I've had many, many, many people try to put me down. I was told that I was never going to be muscular by some people, that I had a small frame. I was told that I was not going to succeed in business. I was told so much garbage that today I'm like the complete opposite. So fuck anybody who doubts you. Be the best version of you. Walk your own path. And eventually all those people are going to be sucking up. At that point, you can either do two things. Either change your heart, you know, embrace them, show some love. Or you could say, fuck you, you fake piece of shit. So that's all I got to say. Hope you guys enjoyed this Q&A video. If you got more questions, leave them down below and I will talk to you all next week.